so now we're on uh, uh, notes 28. It's page 135. This is review, so it's not a not a bad thing for me to be ending on. I've got a. a this review is going to suggest a few more things that I want to hit, like uh, dip filtering, just because it's so incredibly useful in processing field data. I'd like you guys to know about it. Um, it's uh, it's already implemented in my um, in my JRG ViewMat uh, processing system, so um, you know it's available to you. Uh, and that'll you know the motivation for that will come out of this uh, this uh, perspective. Uh, uh, review here, but it's not a bad place to end the class here. Uh, so let me let me see how much uh, review I can get through here in the next uh, twenty minutes. Um, uh, and this is, uh, um, you know, we've we've learned a lot about um, convolution and filtering, and uh, especially the Fourier transform uh, in the first half of the class. And some of that, especially our, our knowledge of the Fourier transform, uh, we, we brought forward to the second half of the class, where we started uh, looking uh, not in just the time dimension, but also in time and x, and, and our spatial and time data sets. Okay? So we have now um, a pretty good toolbox. Um, we can filter data. We can we can take a chirp survey or a stack section, and we can we can migrate it in various ways. Some of them simple, and using some very gross uh, approximations about uh, uh, and assumptions about velocity, for instance. And others, uh, you know, more adaptable. You know, maybe not so obvious, but more adaptable and and uh, more tunable. Um, and especially this discussion about uh, boundary conditions is. Uh, is one place where you know there's a lot to play with here. Uh, you can make your your results look better, you know, for and and please your clients better if you have um, some some you know wiggle room to uh, uh, to try some of these things. Uh, so uh, uh, let me let me go back and and step back and and do a little review of of what we've been working on in the in the second half of the class. Okay. So uh, so far we've been doing work mostly really on, on wave extrapolation. Okay, this is the, the continuation of data that we have, data that we know, uh, on in one place into a region where we don't know the the data, we don't know the wave field. Okay, so we have our two D uh, chirp survey. Okay, and um, and we have a, a an exploding reflector in there. And so, in the cross section, the front um, face of this cube, okay, we have a uh, an exploding reflector at one one point, you know, some uh, x and z uh, coordinate, uh, just a just a two D Earth, right? This it's not a three dimensional Earth. There's no y component here, uh, and at time t equals zero, the exploding reflector goes off. Okay, uh, so that's in the the model. All right. Now what we what we get in the zero offset data set in the chirp data set is the projection of the expanding cone from that exploding reflector. You know, its slice, the slice of that cone in the data direction is a hyperbola. Okay. And the data exists at zero depth, right? Because our chirp survey, we only collect at the surface of the lake. Okay. Uh, and um, uh, at all time, whereas our cross section is only at zero time, uh, but for all depths. Okay, so the model is the front face; the data are the uh, the top face. The um, uh, the side face here uh, we'll actually look at uh, in a few minutes. That that I would call a uh, vertical seismic profile. Okay. Uh, and it's you know that's data for all time at different values of z, okay. So we'll we'll look at that too. But uh, you know going from the data to the model, okay, uh, finding the, locating those exploding reflectors that's called migration, and uh, going the other way, you know inverse migration we call diffraction, okay. We can do this for waves in the Earth if we think they obey the acoustic wave equation, which chirp data really do. Uh, you know, 
in most places, the chirp data is not going to be uh, not going to show us reflectors very far below the bottom of the lake. And it's going to show us reflectors that are mostly in the very waterlogged muds. So it's really acoustic still. The shear velocity is so low that it doesn't count. It's, it, it holds this acoustic wave equation very well. Now, we derived the acoustic wave equation. We found that uh, d squared p dt squared is equal not to velocity times uh, the Laplacian of, uh, of the wave field, which is the horizontal derivatives, but to this more complicated thing that has horizontal derivatives of the spatially variable density buried inside it. So it's k times the um, uh, divergence of 1 over the density field. Okay, So density is, is spatially variable here, uh, acting on uh, uh, the uh, gradient of the, uh, uh, which is all you know, uh, still acting on the, the gradient of the, uh, of the wave field. Okay, so um, you know if 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 in space and time we have constant k incompressibility and constant density rho, then we have constant velocity and we just pull it all up. Okay, pull it all out. The the wave field is a summation of of simple cones in x z t space, right? Uh, and uh, we're just summing up uh, a cone for every exploding reflecting point. Okay, and we can downward continue also in uh, uh, in Fourier space, kx, kz, and omega space, an image with Stolt migration. Now that's very fast because of the convenience of the uh, uh, of the fast Fourier transform, which now you know how to derive as well. So our um, we take our our wave field, our uh, our surface data, p of uh, x and t. And we uh, do a 2D uh, Fourier transform uh, to p and kx and omega, and we do a mapping of um, k uh, uh, of omega to kz, okay, and then um, according to this, the same dispersion relation, which we derive from the the simple constant velocity acoustic wave equation, right? There's our constant velocity sitting in there, and um, that's. Uh, uh, and then we do a 2D inverse Fourier transform. We have p prime or q, as we as we called it, in kx and kz, and we did an inverse uh, 2D spatial transform to our reflectivity section r in x and z. Okay. Now, if uh, if we allow density to still be constant in space and of course time, but we allow a variable uh, k. Okay, we allow k to vary in x and z, and in fact, k varies can vary any way it likes in z. It can vary sharply in z, like a well log, but it has to vary only slowly in um, in x. So our 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 spatially variable k and thus velocity is similar to the horizontally averaged k. All right, which still vary, can vary any way we like in as rapidly as we like in, in depth z. All right, another way of saying this is dk dx or dv dx, you know, with constant velocity, is close to zero. Okay, it's slow, slow varying in x. So uh, we've got to solve some. Uh, we've got to take some approximation to the acoustic wave equation before it's simple enough for us to find a difference in. Finite difference along at least the x and z axes. Okay, so uh, uh, you know the first way of simplifying the full wave equation is to get rid of that second order z derivative, the d squared p dz squared, and and then we can approximate we can approximate the equation with an extrapolation equation. Okay, that only has uh, dp dz terms. There's no second order z derivatives. We only have a first order z derivative. Okay, so that's the first order of approximation. Um, the next approximation that we'll use is that we'll assume only one way uh, waves in z, upgoing waves, uh, or or as is the case with lab eight, downgoing waves. Okay. And then we'll develop extrapolation equations from the continued fraction expansion of the square root radical in the dispersion relation, right? So we have 
you know, the full wave equation says that kz is equal to the square root of the quantity omega squared over v squared minus kx squared. You know, if we can if we can get rid of that square root somehow, uh, which we do with that Muir continued fraction expansion of the square root, then uh, we can find a, a whole set of increasingly accurate extrapolators where, as we go from, you know, one step of accuracy to the next, we move up only only in in terms of one uh, derivative. Okay, we always have just one uh, first order derivative in z. But you know our time derivatives, our x derivatives, we could have uh, you know uh, quadruple derivatives, uh, quintuple derivatives. Uh, all that's allowed by that continued fraction expansion, and then converting the dispersion relations back into um, back into um, um, the time the uh, the time and, and x domain. Um, the uh, the differencing methods, all right, that we uh, that we apply to these equations, these extrapolation equations, we can divide them into explicit methods that have you know one uh, one sample hanging down at the next uh, uh, the next say uh, z level, okay, that we can easily solve for explicitly, uh, you know, one at a time, uh, go, applying it across the row, kind of as a as a two D uh, convolution. Uh, or an implicit method where we're going to solve for the whole next row at once. Okay, and we, uh, uh, you know, that that is made uh, um, very easy actually by the uh, the simplicity of the of the matrix uh, that uh, expresses the system of equations. Um, so those tridiagonal matrices, you you can indeed solve very fast uh, and very and deterministically. You know, no problem, no approximation. For the next, uh, or no additional approximation, for the next level. Okay, and work your way down. Now, um, the explicit dufort frankel method, where uh, we weirdly do not use at all the data that sits in the center of the differencing star, and the implicit crank nicholson methods are always stable. So, you know, we could we could jump all the way from uh, from our service data to uh, the depth level. You know, downward continue to the depth level at the very bottom of our of our section if we wanted to, but we don't. We we want to get some detail in depth, so we tend to use uh, small uh, small steps of delta z anyway. So uh, uh, okay, I talked about the tridiagonal matrices already, uh, and then we have to worry about the boundary conditions on x since we we haven't recorded data all the way around the world. Um, you know, we have a, a an edge to our data, an edge to our finite difference grid, and what do we do? Since all we can do outside that that boundary, you know, outside our data recording is is assume that the data are zero, and that's not physically correct, right? Because we know those reflections are there, um, and if we assume they're zero, then we get side reflections. Okay, um, so. Uh, uh, Here's where we get computationally tricky, and we change the rules. and And right at the edges of our calculation, we actually use a, a different and very uh, fractured uh, quarter circle uh, wave extrapolator to uh, um, allow the reflections uh, uh, to keep those reflections propagating out of the grid, and not, you know, at least to some extent, not let them propagate back into the grid. So uh, you know, in, in labs uh, seven and uh, uh, and eight, um, we impl we implement migration and modeling for zero offset data and the exploiting reflector model. So we haven't we haven't really gone beyond that yet. So here, let me discuss some situations where um, where we might uh, uh, we might go beyond uh, zero offset you know chirp data. Um, and uh, uh, and stacks. Okay, so I'm going to express a wave field in terms of all of these different dimensions, and and the dimensions are are related, uh, but um, you know this is really the way that that all that your data could come. All right, so, you know these dimensions are some dimensions are independent. You know x is independent of y is independent of z. well, but in our work uh, the z uh, direction is not that independent. 
uh, the time direction is not not totally independent from x or y, uh, and then uh, the horizontal wave number k, which is related to velocity, okay, uh, is not very independent. Um, an offset is uh, uh, which I'll for reasons uh, that, that aren't clear in this class, I'll call that h. That means half offset. Okay, just like we've used half velocity with our spoiler reflector model, you know, for some you know some convenience in our equations, we'll also use half offset later on when we talk about you know having a non-zero distance between the source and receiver on the surface, which is the way we do all of our all of our uh, you know non-marine surveys and many of our marine surveys as well. But uh, you know, for chirp data, the offset is equal to zero. So these are really just ways of slicing our, our wave field. Okay, x, y, z, t, v, and h for offset. Okay, so what if we have uh, you know constant y, okay, two-dimensional Earth, and constant velocity and constant offset equal to zero? Okay, h equal to zero. What that means is is what we've been dealing with. We have, uh, you know, we, we're doing a chirp chirp survey across the surface of the uh, of the Earth, and uh, or or the, the the surface of the water, and we'll record those uh, reflection and diffraction hyperbolas. You know, migration will take us to the exploding reflector model, and diffraction will take us back, and and uh, really. Uh, uh, you know, with constant velocity, there's no uh, there's no penalty to using uh, FK migration like Stolt migration or Gazdag migration. So uh, um, that's exactly this is you know how the the kind of data we've been using, looking at uh, and talking about migrating. This is how we would express it in in the terms that I I've, I've set down here. Okay, now what if we have all the same stuff? Uh, you know. 2D Earth, uh, zero offset data, but v bar z. Okay, we can deal with this using finite difference extrapolation. All right, and um, we might do it in the uh, in the uh, we might we might do the extrapolation in the omega domain, uh, like in lab eight, uh, or uh, uh, like lab nine, which you're not doing. Uh, we can do it in the time domain. Okay, and here's the out the sort of scheme for doing it in the time domain. Okay, now what about you know let's let's be creative a little bit here. What if we don't have constant y? What if we have you know zero offset source and receiver combinations all over the surface of the uh, of the lake, for instance? You know, what if we did that chirp survey you know on a grid and just swept. You know, back and forth across the lake. I mean, uh, Amy Isis's uh, uh, Pyramid Lake survey is almost like that. There's a lot of 3D data there. Okay, and um, uh, and and of course the the reflectors are you know have have 3D uh, structure as well. Okay, and uh, you know we have we we would want to we might want to handle certain uh, increases in velocity with depth. Okay. Uh, maybe in terms of a thin lens term, but uh, you know, really with some conceptually simple extensions of exactly what we've been talking about this semester, we can handle this situation too. Okay, um, you know, you can write down a uh, Stolt migration and a and a uh, uh, and an omega stretch for um, uh, for three D data. Okay, and uh, it's not that difficult. Um, of course, you start running into memory problems a lot sooner with uh, 3D data, and you, have, you might have to use that uh, that card trick I showed you for uh, uh, for reorganizing your data and, and uh, turning the matrices and finding the uh, the vectors that you're that you're putting through your 3D uh, Fourier transform, right? So uh, uh, that uh, uh, you know adds some computational uh, uh, expense and difficulty, maybe, but uh, Conceptually, it's 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 pretty simple. We can write those equations down pretty fast. Okay. Uh, another another thing we we might want to do to extend the kinds of data sets we look at is to okay, let's go back to two D Earth, but what about non-zero offset data? Okay, and that's really what 
what I would launch into uh, in uh, in the beginning of 757. Okay, geology 757 is what do we do with non-zero offsets? All right, so uh, we can't have any exploding reflectors anymore. Okay, because the 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 sources are separated from the receivers, and we don't have the same path down as we did back up. Okay, so uh, what we do, we have to come up with a new imaging condition. Okay, uh, but for the remember, migration is is downward continuation plus imaging. For the downward continuation, we can use the same extrapolators, still two D Earth, so all the same, but a new imaging condition and more data. But that's that's not a big deal. Here's a here's another thing to consider, and this is going to uh, launch us off a little bit into uh, 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 I don't know, it's it's kind of a sidebar, but I it's so useful that I I, I just love to uh, include it. What if we had? Let's see. No, oh, I'm sorry, not this one yet. Okay. Um, what if we have two um, uh, D Earth? Okay, constant vo uh, velocity that that is strictly only uh, variable in z, okay, and offset. All right, so this is like a refraction, and, and of course, if, if velocity increases with depth, you know you're going to get these turning waves or or head waves, and um, but we have only flat layers, okay, and um, uh, there's a uh, uh, what we're really dealing with here are refractions. You know, first arrivals. We've talked about reflections so far, and we've ignored the first arrivals, right? In, in many data sets, what we know the best are the first arrivals. Okay, so um, uh, what can we do with that? We can actually um, let's see. Uh, uh, we can actually transform that data set into velocity space. Okay, and uh, after downward continuation, right? We can transform it into velocity, space, and time, and then after downward continuation, instead of time, we have z, and we have velocity, space versus depth, which means that we can get the. This is a new method of getting the. Uh, well, not so new anymore, but um, it's a way of getting the. Uh, um, it, it's a way of getting a velocity profile. This actually was used very effectively in the Imperial Valley, uh, uh, in, kind of in the early days, and and uh, coordinated very well with uh, uh, sort of the overall setting of the Imperial Valley and and the fact that that you know you have uh, continental sediments sitting above a uh, um, an oceanic spreading center, uh, you've got active metamorphism going on within that that stack of sediments uh, with the very high temperatures that uh, that are available there and lots of fluid. Uh, so that's a uh, another uh, uh, Clayton paper, um, the, a couple of Clayton papers that uh, have some very interesting implications. Um, all right, so now uh, this is the one, um, the vertical seismic pro profile (VSP). That's a situation that I'll go into tomorrow, and uh, it'll it'll help us develop the uh, dip filter idea. All right, so notice that's uh, you know not just multi-offset data. Uh, in the uh, on the surface, but now we're sinking our receivers uh, literally, you know, actually into the ground by putting receivers uh, down uh, in a well, and uh, and here's where we're looking at that uh, data set that's in all time, but the receivers are at different depth z. So that'll go into that tomorrow. Okay, so we're at the bottom of page one thirty nine. I'm now in uh, notes number 28, about the middle of it. Um, and I've been talking about um, different problems than, um, than zero offset migration, and, uh, but still problems that we can solve using exactly the, uh, the wave extrapolation tools that we've been learning. So the, uh, the next problem is this. Um, Wave field where we have a 2D Earth, and uh, now instead of recording data just at z equals zero, we make recordings in a vertical seismic profile. So we actually put uh, geophones down a uh, down a hole, and we can record sources that uh, maybe could be in another hole. That's a that's a cross hole survey, uh, or uh, more commonly on the surface. 
and that's uh, known as a vertical seismic profile. Uh, obviously, the concept of offset h has to be modified to recognize the uh, the 3D or, or here at least 2D nature of the uh, distance, the separation between the the source and the receiver. Um, and uh, you know, from the borehole, of course, and from this VSP, uh, and in fact. Uh, uh, Kyle Gray and I were working on uh, this kind of data set from uh, Eastern Nevada. It's very easy to uh, to get that uh, an excellent record of velocity and how it changes with depth. Um, but of course, uh, you might want it to be a laterally fairly smooth velocity, as we represent with the uh, v bar z, the horizontally average velocity. Uh, we want it to be relatively smooth because you know our knowledge of the uh, of the velocities is extremely good at the at the borehole uh, due to this VSP data set, but uh, not so good when you go away from the borehole. And so the question is, um, you know, what can we do with this uh, uh, with this kind of data set? Uh, let me show you what a VSP data set looks like when you plot it out as a record section. Usually, it's plotted um, with uh, you know with um, Say chirp data, we plot time uh, going down, time increasing down, because you know in increasing time means increasing depth. Well, you know here in a VSP we have receivers at different depths, so we plot each receiver seismogram horizontally. So the time axis is horizontal, and uh, of course then we arrange uh, the seismograms in terms of z going down, and you know, on each seismogram, there's going to be some arrivals. For instance, the if we have a um, a source, uh, this is a record where the source is right at the top of the hole. So, you know, there's there should be a star right here. Um, you know, right at zero depth and zero time, that's where the first arrival is, of course, just like a regular refraction record. And then, as the receiver gets deeper, of course, it takes some time for the waves to propagate down to those deeper receivers. And so that's the move out you're seeing on this first arrival here. Now, if velocity increases somewhere uh, with depth, then uh, it'll be uh, there'll be a branch like this that uh, is at a steeper uh, slope because it's taking um, less time for the uh, for the waves to propagate, uh, uh, you know, from from the top of the high velocity layer down to wherever the receiver is in that layer. And then, if velocity uh, uh, goes down again, uh, decreases with depth, then you get a uh, um, the first arrival will cut back at a at a shallower slope, and then it'll increase again, and the the uh, first arrival will will cut down at a steeper slope again, as you might expect. At every you know sharp velocity transition, you'll get a reflection, and since uh, in this case the uh, the sources and receivers are right on the uh, uh, right at the well, okay. The reflection here. Notice it's got a slope that is opposite to the um, the first arrival, uh, but that's the reflection, you know, which of course is propagating up the well, you know, back toward the surface. And here is a uh, a negative reflection, you know, from the top of the low velocity zone, which is you know have the the, the 180 degree uh, different phase than the positive reflection. And that will propagate uh, up. Um, that'll propagate up uh, as well. And here's the positive reflection that's uh, then refracting through the other velocities. And and here is a, a diffraction from a uh, a deeper or a reflector uh, that doesn't appear at the well, although you think it might. You know, right right down at this uh, further depth. Um, or perhaps a reflector that uh, is, uh, you know, in three dimensions out of plane. Okay, um, you know, here we're just considering two uh, D cases. So this is a very common and very uh, useful data set. Um, for um, uh, th there's been a lot of VSPs now in in Nevada in uh, mining prospects and um, and geothermal prospects. So we're um, we're starting to see even this kind of data in our own area, not just in in uh, you know Texas oil fields, um, 
And so, um, you know, as, as I've, I've shown you, there's uh, really two kinds of waves in these VSP data sets. Okay, so here's um, a couple of cross sections. And, uh, you know, the velocity part of the data set is essentially direct waves that are going down, they're propagating down to the receiver, the sources at the surface, and the direct waves propagate down to the receiver. Okay, and there's also uh, reflected waves that are upgoing. Okay, so a, a wave propagates down from a source, it hits some reflector that's below the receiver, and propagates essentially up to the to the receiver. So uh, how that looks in a VSP data set is uh, you know we have this um, you know of course z is down and t is increasing to the right, so we have this direct wave which is uh, propagating down and it's uh, down to the right, and then the green reflected wave has an opposite slope, which is up to the right. So you know we want to we might want to separate these wave fields. For instance, we could come up with an imaging condition, and we could uh, uh, we could migrate these data, uh, and it's particularly easy to come up with an imaging condition and do the migration using uh, superposition Kirchhoff sum migration. Uh, I've done a bit of that. Um, and uh, it's it's conceptually uh, fairly simple. So, you know, we but the trouble is uh, the Kirchhoff sum migration will take everything that we feed it in the data and then blow it out across the whole cross section, and we'll end up recovering you know this reflector in here. Uh, but there will also be a whole bunch of artifacts from the direct waves which are improperly handled by the uh, uh, improperly handled by the um, uh, by the Kirchhoff sum imaging. So uh, you know, one strategy, of course, is to just apply a, a mute to the first arrival. But there may be other uh, other waves going up or or, or coming down. Uh, I'm not showing them in any examples of those here, but uh, uh, there are often uh, a lot of very strong waves that are that are uh, essentially propagating down. Um, you know, say coming out from uh, reverberations uh, near the surface. So those are um, um, those are a, a problem uh, uh, in the data processing that we might wish to uh, to resolve. Okay, and uh, you know, one w an easy way to do that is uh, you know forget the the mute, which has to be done by hand, and it's kind of difficult. You know, let's let's just find some way of separating. The, the downgoing wave field from the upgoing wave field, you know, on the basis of the slope or the you know the dip in the VSP data display. All right. Uh, another example of separating wave fields on the basis of slope is when we have a, a faulted sedimentary section, um, and maybe it's worth trying even uh, Tyler on on you know some sections from your data set uh, at at Soda Lake. Uh, you know, you have uh, you know. Mildly, you know, faulted uh, uh, stratigraphic horizons, and really uh, uh, the stratigraphy is, uh, you know, is very strong reflections. But you know that at every fault, you know, there's got to be a diffraction buried underneath there, and you might not even be able to, to, you know, look at the stratigraphic offset uh, very well. But often when there's a fault. Um, even if the stratigraphic offset is, you know, like even less than a quarter of the wavelength of the of the seismic waves, it still generates a, a diffraction. You know, what if you could pull those diffractions out and use those to interpret the fault in the in the two D section? Okay, um, and, you know, it's a difficult thing to do with, um, um, especially with uh, with on land. Um, um, Stack data sets, but uh, in a chirp data set, I think this would work quite well, um, because uh, you know they're they're very very clean and they do contain all of these uh, all of these diffractions. So it, would there be a way, uh, you know, you know, for VSP data, we we want to remove the positive uh, dipping uh, reflections or positive dipping waves and keep the negative dipping waves. Here we would we would alternatively like to remove the the flat uh, dipping waves, 
the, str the stratigraphy and leave the steeply dipping waves, which would be the hyperbola tails, and, and locate faults uh, with that. So um, uh, you know, we, ca we can either uh, uh, you know, separate positive. Right Here's the, the dip. Kz over omega is greater than 0 for the brown one. Kz over omega is less than 0 for the green one. That's one way. OK, um, let's see. Uh, Kz is, um, is 0. And so Kz over omega is 0 for the flat waves. And kz over omega is non-zero for the dipping diffractions. Okay, so there's, you know, we can either look for the, you know positive versus negative, or we can look for near zero versus versus not near zero. Okay. So that's the subject of what are called dip filters. You know, thinking that you're looking at a geologic section and you want to um, you want to emphasize. Uh, uh, structures that that or de-emphasized structures that have certain dips. Okay, so how would we how would we dip filter? Okay, so let's say we have uh, these two situations, right? We have the uh, uh, the negative kz and uh, and th those are in red, and the positive kz are the black lines. Or here the um, uh, the kz that are close to zero are are black. And the kz that are away from zero are are red. All right. And uh, so so we can you know we know how to do a two D Fourier transform of uh, of data. Uh, and notice uh, for this data set, this is you know this is this is just a standard uh, say stack uh, stack section or migrated section even. So uh, time is pointing down and x is pointing to the right. And then I'm going to uh, Plot the Fourier transform, the two D Fourier transform of that data set. Okay, so the uh, the lines, you know, which are constant kz over omega, you know, they essentially become points in the uh, uh, in the kx and uh, in the, I'm sorry, kx over uh, omega, right? Black here is kx is uh, is uh, zero. Uh, and kx is uh, is positive here. Kx is negative here. All right, that clarification. Uh, we we then uh, do the two D Fourier transform, and we're we're going to plot maybe the power spectrum, say, yeah, and and uh, or maybe we'll, I'm just plotting the real part here. Uh, so um, the uh, uh, you know kx is increasing to the right. Omega is increasing up. Okay, the uh, the steep um, the steep black ones with uh, with positive uh, positive kx, they occur. You know, they, they're a point in uh, positive omega, po the positive omega positive kx quadrant, and also in the negative omega negative kx quadrant. Right, kx over omega is positive. Where kx over omega is negative, that's the red ones. You know, tilted to the left. And uh, they're going to occur in the uh, in the quadrant with mixed signs, you know. So here omega is positive and kx is negative. Here omega is negative, kx is positive. So, you know, if we if we want to preserve, say, the right leaning um, structure, then we would we would zero out the mixed sign quadrants, and we would keep we would keep what's in the uh, uh, what's in the uh, um, What's in the, the 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 same sign quadrants, right? So we would zero these out and keep these two, and we would do the inverse two uh, D Fourier transform, and what we would have would hopefully look like this, where we would have filtered out the left leaning uh, component and just kept the right leaning component. Likewise, if what we're looking for is the magnitude of the of the dip, quote unquote, all right. The uh, uh, the black ones, okay, that are flat, they're on the omega axis or very near the omega axis. Okay, the ones that are are dipping uh, 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 that have uh, high dip, you know, like these ones are are negative, so they occur in these quadrants. Okay, uh, but really, um, 
if we had dips to the right, then those would be in these quadrants too. The way we would select the uh, low dipping uh, um, part of the part of the section is we would um, take this cone around the omega axis, right? Zero out any, everything that's uh, that's not within that within that cone, and then do the inverse of uh, 2D Fourier transform, and we could get uh, we could get just the flat stuff preserved. Okay. If we wanted to preserve the high dipping stuff, we would we would simply we'd zero out what's inside the cone, what's close to the omega axis, and we would keep everything else. So uh, you know those FK methods are pretty effective, um, but um, there are some there are some uh, disadvantages. Um, you know if you got a big section, it's not a disadvantage anymore. But um, if you have a big section, then uh, uh, you know the 2D Fourier transform can be can be a bit painful. So, for instance, in processing, say all of um, uh, all of Amy Isis's uh, Pyramid Lake chirp data, uh, or processing a whole bunch of Salt and Sea chirp data, you know, with a uh, with a you know where they have uh, tens, maybe hundreds of thousands of traces, maybe a million traces in the, in all of Salt and Sea. Um, it gets pretty hard to shove that all through a, a 2D uh, Fourier, fast Fourier transform. Okay, so we might we might want some way uh, where we can uh, process the data, you know, without the Fourier transform. The Fourier transform also, you know, it's a global operator, right? So once we once we select our our say our slope here, our cone, you know, and that's basically the width of the cone basically selects. Uh, you know just how flat things have to be to be preserved in our dip filter, then um, you know that selection is applied uniformly across the whole section. I mean, maybe we want to keep uh, you know we want to identify things that are flat uh, at the top of the section, and they have to be very flat to come through. But we've got wormier reflections deeper down in the section, and we want to preserve more. Okay, the the Fourier transform won't let you do that. You know, you can't alter the properties of the dip filter versus time or x, okay, in either in either direction, uh, and and that's very that's a very useful thing to do is is to be able to tune your filters, you know, depending on where you are in the section. That's very very useful. So we'd like to do dip filtering in the xt domain, okay, and. Uh, uh, Another advantage of the XT domain is that we could we could imagine applying it to unevenly sampled data. The code that I have for dip filtering, the dip fill uh, method in um, JRG, that 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 needs evenly sampled data. But uh, it, you you could you could figure out how to implement that in for unevenly sampled data. Uh, there's also of course the causality problem. Every time we we take the Fourier transform in uh, in in omega, okay, from t to omega, and we you know here we we're doing some violence to the data. We're we're zeroing out half the data at least, right, in the Fourier domain. Um, then uh, we inverse Fourier transform, and our data aren't causal anymore. There's going to be arrivals before the first arrivals, and and that may be you know really a real problem, okay. So uh, you know an, an, a filter done in the xt domain. Uh, could also preserve causality. Okay, turns out that um, the uh, there's a brilliant implementation by a Clairbout student named Dave Hale, who's now a, a big wig researcher uh, in Western GCO, I think. Uh, oh no, he's he's gone to the Colorado School of Mines, so uh, he's one of our you know he's one of our intellectual leaders, and he implemented these. XT domain dip filters uh, brilliantly. It's it's so fast and easy, uh, and wrote a paper on it. So he taught the rest of us uh, how to do it. And then there's this uh, there's this um, um, this concept of of being able to vary the filter in space and time, which you know my my code, which is based on Dave Hale's, uh, still doesn't allow you to do, but uh, you could see how to do it. Okay. So, so where Hale started was was with the supposition that we have band limited data, okay, and um, 
So uh, let's let's just for sake of argument, let's say that that our data is so band limited that omega is a constant. Okay, so we can you know we'll we'll see what we can do with that. Um, and we want a filter uh, where we we put a wave field into the filter and and that's p. The input is p and the output is q. Q is the filtered data set. Okay, so in the uh, uh, you know our 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 axes are. Um, uh, uh, you know, thinking uh, of course, thinking in the Fourier domain, whether we use the Fourier domain or not, but thinking in the Fourier domain. Um, uh, here are a couple of of dip filters. You know, for for constant omega, right? We take omega out um, of the equation if we make it a constant, and um, and so these uh, these filters are in terms of k. That's the horizontal wave number k. Right, that's the, the spatial frequency, uh, and it's a rotational frequency, of course. Um, so uh, the output Q is equal to uh, alpha, some adjustable parameter alpha, divided by alpha plus k squared, okay, and, and that multiplied by P, the, the input wave field, that's going to give us a low dip pass filter. And then if we want a high dip pass filter, we could use uh, q is equal to k squared over alpha plus k squared times p. Okay, so uh, alpha is an adjustable parameter. We'll have to see what what we need to set that to, uh, and that's what we would vary with with x and t. All right. So now, how do we you know how do we actually accomplish this this filter? Okay, um, you know we want to do it in in time and uh, and x. So uh, well, we all we need to do is take these these uh, uh, Fourier domain equations and transform them into um, into time domain, time and x domain equations. You know how to do that because you know that the approximate Fourier dual of our um, of of k squared, right, is big D squared. What is big D squared? That's our, our second order finite difference in x, okay? Uh, which which you also know as the matrix as a tridiagonal matrix T, which looks like this, right? So uh, uh, you know we clear the uh, uh, all right all right well well what are we going to substitute here? Okay, so k squared p it has a Fourier dual with big D, approximately at least with big D squared p. Which is really the uh, tridiagonal equation, uh, which is uh, uh, has minus two in the diagonal and ones on the side diagonals, applied to the p vectors in x, and every p vector in x is at a certain time. Okay, um, so we'll, I'll put t as a uh, as a superscript. It's not a power. Uh, t is a superscript to keep track of what time level we're at. Okay, so uh, we we make these uh, equations. Our low pass filter is alpha plus k squared times q, and that Fourier transforms to alpha. Uh, right, we're going to take it all the way to the uh, the k squared becomes t. Right. Uh, so what does alpha become? Well, that has to be alpha uh, times the identity uh, uh, matrix plus the tridiagonal matrix. Okay, so that sum that the, that summed matrix is applied to Q at t, and uh, that's equal to alpha times p at t. The high pass filter, likewise, it, high dip pass is uh, alpha plus k squared times Q equal to k squared p. All right, so we have uh, alpha i uh, identity matrix plus the tridiagonal matrix. Um, that's applied to Q at t. And the uh, the uh, uh, right hand side is the tridiagonal matrix applied to uh, p of t. All right. Now these should be somewhat familiar looking equations, right? Our, our unknown is q. That's our output. the The input is p, right? And we already know how to solve uh, tridiagonal systems of equations like this. Uh, and we have a, a nice, uh, you know, all of the, all of this is is uh, 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 alpha, you know, the tridiagonal, ma tridiagonal matrix, uh, the identity matrix. Those are all real numbers. There's no complex numbers in this system, so we already know how to solve a, a real uh, or complex uh, uh, system. We can solve for q at t. 
using our tridiagonal matrix solver. Okay, because you know uh, alpha uh, i plus t is still tri tridiagonal, and and we we know even how to you know in our solver we can let we can let uh, 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 you know, just every time we invoke our solver, we can we can have alpha varying with time, right? Because it's applied, the, the solver is applied at every at every different time step, uh, and and if we insert uh, various values, you know, say from alpha zero, alpha one, alpha two, up to alpha n x, if we insert those along the diagonal, then uh, we can also vary our, uh, uh, and and we can do that with our 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 tries dot java. Uh, tridiagonal matrix uh, solver. Um, you know we can vary we can uh, uh, vary the uh, effect of the filter at x as well. So uh, uh, here's the uh, here's the matrix that we're uh, uh, the tridiagonal matrix we're, we're we're using right. That's uh, alpha, which can be a function of x times uh, the identity matrix plus the tridiagonal matrix right. So we get uh, minus two alpha zero minus two alpha one and so forth. Um, along the diagonal, and then uh, one on the side diagonal still. So, um, uh, OK, now, um, uh, so all this is developed using uh, constant omega, right? Um, now, uh, P and Q, right, they can either depend on time or, or frequency, right? So we can. Uh, um, we can do this. In, we can do this in the frequency domain if we don't want to change. Uh, if we don't want to alter the uh, the slope with time, okay. Uh, and let, let's suppose that omega is is uh, not equal to a constant. You know, I said originally omega not equal to zero, but but it's not uh, not about a constant either. So what we have is we have some bandwidth delta omega that uh, we're going to want to apply this to, okay. And so, in that case, you know, we can modify the low-pass filter to look like, uh, you know, putting the omega in. Uh, we have alpha over uh, alpha plus k squared over minus i omega applied to p, and then the high dip pass filter is k squared over minus i omega over the quantity alpha plus k squared over minus i omega, and that's applied to to p. And and so we can plot that out in. Uh, in uh, k uh, omega space, okay, and see what we're what we're uh, rejecting and what we're keeping. Now, all of these should be uh, all these lines, the the dash line here in red, the the parabolas here. You know, those should all uh, uh, hit uh, uh, hit uh, you know zero omega zero k. Okay, it's it's a little bit difficult to see here. Um, so, so you can see that that with these equations, really we, we have uh, parabolas of the effect of our of our filter. Okay, so we're uh, for instance for the for the uh, you know if if we're using the low dip pass filter, then uh, we're keeping what's within this parabola, if at least if alpha is you know fairly small, uh, or, and and within this parabola. Okay, and just looking at the uh, the positive um, uh, positive omega, um, we have uh, 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 you know we have this parabola. We're keep you know we're doing high dip reject and low dip pass uh, by keeping what's close to the omega axis. And um, if you think about uh, you know some limited bandwidth delta omega here. Then that parabola is going to be sort of, you know, especially if the band is fairly narrow. But even if not, you know, the parabola is sort of uh, approximated by a line through the uh, the zero uh, uh, the zero point, and and so then it becomes the same uh, cone. You know, we're we're we got a you know within a limited band, we've got kind of a, a rough approximation of this uh, you know pie slice. Uh, or, or central central slice type of, of filter idea, okay, where we want these straight lines going through the, the middle, and and we're not getting straight lines, but you know, within a a, a limited delta omega, it, you know, it does look straighter than that. So not too bad, you know. It's 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 
you know, the diff filter is going to do what it does, okay, but um, it's uh, uh, it's going to um, uh, the the effect of the dip filter is going to be understandable in terms of the same pie slice idea. Okay, it won't be quite that, but but it'll be close. All right, whether we'll be able to tell a difference, I don't know. Um, okay, so now for the uh, uh, these you know limited bandwidth filters, you know not not constant frequency, but but some limited delta omega, you know we can we can write it out uh, and include the uh, the omega in here, um, and uh, so we clear the fraction. Say for the low dip pass filter, uh, you know we have minus i omega alpha plus k squared times uh, q is equal to minus i omega alpha times p, and um, um, and so the uh, uh, let's see. I don't think I. Uh, let's see. So this is just uh, um, right. Right. We have this at uh, you know here. This is putting in uh, the tridiagonal matrix for k. We still got the omegas in here. So we uh, we want to convert the uh, the minus i omegas to ddt or you know big D plus uh, in the t direction. Right. The that's the simple uh, that's the simple. Uh, finite difference operator applied in uh, in time, okay. But we do want to make sure that all terms are centered at t plus half, okay. And so we'll take a, a you know our usual averaging approach to that, okay. So we have uh, uh, you know this is operated. This contains a time derivative, right? And so uh, we have um, uh, we break that up into the uh, you know taking out this term right minus i, I omega alpha i times um, times uh, q at t right so the uh, i omega becomes a first uh, time difference so we have the uh, um, uh, the identity matrix scaled by right and of course only the, you know we're scaling the ones along the diagonal of the identity matrix. Scaled by alpha over delta t uh, times uh, this quantity q at t plus one minus q at t, okay, and then the second term is is the tridiagonal matrix uh, uh, times uh, uh, q at t, right? So uh, um, we've got to average that. So we're going to take uh, the tridiagonal matrix times q at t plus one plus q at t over two. So we're going to average all those x vectors, okay. Uh, over in time, and then here uh, on the right-hand side we got another time derivative, and so uh, we've got uh, alpha over delta t times, uh, and now look the time derivative is on p now, not on q. P at t plus one minus p at t. Okay, so now collecting the knowns and unknowns together, okay, and realizing this is a, a recursion, right, because we're going to march down from t equals zero, right? We've got the the input p. We've got all of that. We got that at all times and all x's. The the q's, right? That's the output. So we have a previous output. We have the output at the at the previous time, and then we're going to march down to the output q at the next time t plus one. So we'll put uh, q at t plus one out here on the on the left as a um, uh, as 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 our unknown, right, and and the tridiagonal matrix that's uh, multiplied by that that we put through the tridiagonal solver, which is still real, right? It's alpha over delta t times i plus one half the uh, the second derivative, the second difference tridiagonal matrix. Okay, so that's that's easy. And then on the right hand side we have the knowns, right? And the knowns include the input, right? That's known at t plus one and t, so no problem there. Uh, we can calculate all that at every time step. And then here is the, you know, recursively. Here's the previous output, q at t, you know, which has the same, uh, uh, almost the same matrix uh, applied to it. So the tridiagonal solver, you know, we gotta we gotta calculate all this and and put that in as the 
the d vector in the tridiagonal solver, and here's the the uh, ABC vectors in the tridiagonal solver. Uh, and so you got to ask, okay, what what side boundaries you you use? And and Hale suggests uh, using uh, zero slope side boundaries. Um, so uh, uh, and that seems to work uh, just fine. And this is uh, you know given the speed of the uh, of, of the tridiagonal, especially the real tridiagonal solver, this is just brilliantly fast. You can apply this uh, Hale dip filter to uh, uh, huge data sets with no trouble at all. It's really very very fast, uh, especially with this uh, recursion in it. Right, uh, it uh, it works very quickly. Now uh, you got to remember, right? The the it's really k hat squared and not k that has a Fourier dual with big D squared, right? And and that's what's represented by the tridiagonal matrix. Okay, so uh, you know the the k hat is a good approximation of k at zero, but you know delta x times k hat is equal to two. At the Nyquist, where you know delta x times the real k, which is what we're trying to estimate here, is equal to pi, so it's off by you know half. Um, and so and so you know at um, at higher dips, there's going to be more you know this this dip filter, this Hale dip filter may not be quite as effective. Okay, at low dips, it's it's really good. Um, and, but uh, when I do, you know, the 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 high dip pass uh, version of it is not as good. Okay, um, but I, I I've used the uh, the low dip pass uh, version uh, constantly. Um, it's a great way of getting rid of uh, of diffractions and air waves and uh, um, and surface waves from. Uh, from you know land seismic records uh, before you uh, uh, before you try to stack or, uh, or or migrate them. Okay, 